Today, I'm back at Motor Car Portfolio in Canton, Ohio to take a look at this 1931 Packard Series 8-33. This is the coupe. But before we take the tour, if you're new to the channel, if you just stumbled upon this channel, you've hit the gold mine. This channel, we talk about classic, vintage, some exotics, a lot of orphan cars, cars that are off the beaten path that never really got talked about or reviewed. If that sounds like something that you're interested in, I invite you to hit that subscribe button. Turn on the bell notification right next to it so you never miss a video. Also, like the content so more people can see this video in the future. Okay, let's talk 1931 Packard. But before we talk about that, let's talk about why Packard was such a great company, very innovative company. Here is a list of things that I found that Packard was the first ones to innovate them into the automotive industry. Now, take this list with a grain of salt. I found it on a Packard form, so it should be legit, but you know, there's a lot of stuff going on on this list. Anyway, Packard was the first one to put a steering wheel in a car. 1901, they did that. Standard H pattern was used in 1899. Automatic Spark Advance, 1899. First car with a rumble seat, 1908. Handbrake on the left of the driver, 1915. First mass production of a V12 engine in the United States, 1915. Packard was the first company to use an aluminum piston in an automobile engine in 1915. Hydraulic shock absorbers, 1926. Backup lights, 1927. Pressurized cooling system, 1933. Centralized automatic chassis lubricator, 1933. Ride control for the shock absorbers, 1933. Power hydraulic brakes, 1936. Air conditioning, 1939. Padded dashboard, 1939. Power windows, 1940. Torsion bar suspension, 1955. This is only part of the list. They were a very innovative company. The V12 Packard engine was offered in three versions. The car version, marine version, and the aero version. That engine alone was one of the unsung heroes of both World War I and World War II. Packard, by 1950, was starting to see the writing on the wall. They realized that they can't survive till the end of the decade unless they team up with somebody or merge with somebody. All these other companies started merging together, like uh, Willys mer merged with Overland. Nash and Hudson were in talks with uh, merging together to form AMC. Packard saw Studebaker across the way and didn't know about all of Studebaker's problems. And they were like, man, that's perfect. We'll merge with Studebaker and everything will be great. We're going to make fantastic cars and we'll be in business for a long time. But that's not what happened. Best example I could give to you about what happened is say you're on a dating website and you swipe right and you match up or however it works now and you ask her out on a date. But when your date gets there, it's a dude and you've been catfished. Well, Packard got catfished. 1958, Packard falls on the sword to save Studebaker. And the irony is Packard merged with Studebaker to survive. And the only reason Packard had to die was so that Studebaker could survive. There are a lot of factors that play into that hand. I'm gonna ask the question that's never supposed to be asked. What if Packard never merged with Studebaker? Would either of them be around still? And I guess Romney, the guy that was in charge of AMC, he wanted Packard and Studebaker under the AMC umbrella. Could you imagine that? Maybe if that happened, maybe Packard would still be around today. Probably not, because Chrysler would have still probably bought them out. But who knows? It might it might have changed everything. The thought of having a Packard Jeep is just awesome. The best of two different, totally different worlds. Getting back to the 1931 Packard 833. Packard as a company was as prestigious as, say, like Bentley or Rolls-Royce. Um, other companies that were like Packard that were from America were Duesenberg, Pierce Arrow, and Stutz. But by the 30s, most of those companies were almost extinct. Packard was one of the last great companies from, from the Coach Bill era. And what do we mean by Coach Bill? Well, you could technically buy a chassis. A chassis was essentially... The frame the car sat on, the engine, transmission, running gear, everything but the body. You could take the chassis to any body manufacturer you wanted to. You could take it to Briggs, you could take it to Murphy, Fisher, Fleetwood, any of them. 
and have your own design car put on top of that chassis. That's why doing reviews on these types of cars is really hard because they made numerous, they made a plethora of different bodies from the factory and then you could get it bodied by a different factory. This gets confusing. So Packard offered the 833 as a standard eight. That's generally what it's known as or a custom eight. They also offered other series like the 826. It came in as a chassis form in the 826. They also offered 840 series and an 845 series. They came with bigger engines. Plethora of body styles shared in all of the different series. Body styles offered for the 833 standard 8 series bodies were the Roadster, Phaeton, Sports Phaeton, Touring, Coupe, Convertible coupe, club sedan, sedan, sedan limo, or you could just buy the chassis. The difference between the standard eight and the custom eight was the custom eight was introduced in 1931 and it featured a longer wheelbase than the standard eight. Okay, moving on to the specs of the 1931 Packard standard eight. It rides a wheelbase of 134 and a half inches. It is 195.8 inches long, 71.9 inches wide, 70.7 inches tall. It weighs 4,300 pounds. Pricing started at $2,400 and could go as high as $3,475. That is equivalent to you spending between $45,648.79 now and up to $66,095.64. Now, Packard had its own coach builder called Dietrich. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but if you were getting a Packard style body, more than likely the coach builder Dietrich would do it. Powering the Packard Standard 8 was a 320 cubic inch displacement flathead straight eight. Yes, you heard that right all eight cylinders in a straight line. People say that straight eight engines are the smoothest engines in existence. I honestly can't say if they are or not. I've never driven anything with a straight eight. Getting back to the 320 cubic inch displacement, it was good for 100 horsepower, which was 10 horsepower more than in 1930. Two valves per cylinder, 16 valves total, with nine crankshaft bearings. Compression was 485 to one. Packard in 1931 introduced a all new transmission. It was a four speed synchro mesh unit. It was a no cost option to anybody that asked for it. But if you didn't ask for it, you would get the three speed synchro mesh unit that they that came before it. But I just think it's so cool. All you have to do is ask. Ask and you shall receive. All right, let's talk about this door panel. It's super basic. There's no armrest. Got a window crank right here for the big window. Notice it doesn't have any chrome on the top of the window or whatever. It's just basically a window. But this door is all nicely trimmed out. The same material that's used on the seats is used in the door panel. This looks like real wood. And it probably is. These are brackets for if you wanted wing windows mounted on the outside to help air come in inside. This is for your electric windshield wiper, which is mounted at the top. This window, if you, want, if you release this and that, it'll go forward, which is if you have a car that has the windshield that opens, it's like riding a bike with a steering wheel. It's pretty awesome. There is a rear view mirror. Notice there are no sunshades. Dome light there. Curtains in the back. The windows in the back go down too. So you can roll the windows down if you want. You also have an ashtray. Underside seat is different than the driver's seat because it's more of a jump seat style. So you can fold it forward like that to get in the back. So there's what it looks like as far as the crotch and my steering wheel goes. Notice, look at that view. 
I would love to drive this car every day. I would totally drive this car every day if I had the choice. There's lots, there's lots and lots of headroom in here and the seats are really comfortable. That's the only downer. There's lots of feet room, but you just have to finagle it. This almost looks like a, this steering wheel looks no less than 20 inches. Looks like gigantic steering wheel. I just love, I just love the view looking over the hood like that. It looks amazing. Love the wood features here, the wood trim. Okay, moving on to the button switches and knobs. This car has his and her glove boxes. There's a glove box for the driver and there's also a glove box for the passenger. So it was really cool, unique touch. So that's what this is, is the glove box on the driver's side. There is a big red circular knob. I think that's for the radiator louvers. There's a bunch of like sticky notes in this car, not sticky notes, but labels, labeling what things do. There's two switches on the steering wheel i'm not entirely sure what they do i don't know if one's for advanced and one's for retard for the spark in the comment section below if you know first gauge the speedometer notice the numbers rotate instead of the needle moving so the needle stays stationary and the numbers move around it below it is the odometer and notice that it's split on the right side it only goes up to 99.9 .9 before flipping back to zero all right, moving on to the next gauge. It's at the very top left of this shot. It says cold driving range, and then it says hot. That is the temperature gauge. It's just very interesting on how they word things. At the top right is the oil pressure gauge. In the center, I think that's the gas gauge. Two gauges in the center. I'm pretty sure the one right here is the gas gauge, but like I said, I could be completely wrong. The one right underneath it, I believe, is the amp gauge. There are two buttons protruding outward from the dashboard. One of them, the one on the left-hand side, controls the turn signals. I'm not sure if the one on the right controls the other side of the turn signals. Oil pressure gauge at the top there, which we already said. Beautiful clock. Ignition switch, I believe, is right to the right of that. Cigarette lighter. There is another switch that does something that I'm not entirely sure that's right above the cigarette lighter. Passenger side glove box. All right, so turn signals. Notice they're only on the left-hand side of the car. There is nothing over on the right-hand side of the car. You got brake lights, bumpers, and the bumpers, it's only on the corners because in the center, you got the spare tire. This car has a trunk. Here's where the gas goes, gas filler. This car has a trunk. That's what you have inside your trunk. It's the little details like this. It has its own visor built into the car, which is really cool. Back up front here, look at how big these headlights are. Okay, so this is what the engine looks like on the exhaust side. Look at the carburetor. I don't know what the thinking was to put the carburetor so far down. It's the opposite thinking in which we do now. The carburetor usually sits on top of the engine, whereas on the 30s cars, they sit lower. Okay, moving on to the pros and cons. Uh, I downloaded all the Packard approved accessories as I'm talking about the pros and cons. That's going to play in the background. So Packard offered all kinds of different accessories during this time period different trunks different lights different wheels take a look at that you could feel free to pause it later on if you want to go back and see what they offered and i think some of the prices are there too maybe all right on to the pros and cons getting all the pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars blue chip auto investments 70 years from 1930 to 2000 by richard m langworth and the automotive editors of consumer guide it is just labeled as the Packard 8 in this particular book. As for the pros, nothing less than majestic, plethora of parts, suppliers, strong club support, CCCA classic status. Against it, it they are expensive. They are trucky handling and high operating costs. I just want to give a special thanks to everybody that has subscribed to this channel, who has followed 
this channel and has helped grow this channel into what it is starting to become. Thank you all so much for that. I really appreciate doing all of these videos. And until next time, toodaloo!